Well, we are continuing this uh, study of the, the wells of salvation, or the deep wells of salvation, which is just sort of a, a, a metaphor of a title, if you will, taken from uh, Isaiah chapter 12, where he talks about how we should draw water from the wells of salvation. And when I first started referencing this verse here a couple of weeks ago, uh, I mentioned how in the context he's talking about the ultimate salvation that the nation of Israel will have someday in the kingdom. And we've talked a lot about how salvation early on in this series, several months ago now, just means to deliver. And context, as always, has to determine meaning. And you can be delivered from danger. You can be delivered from physical sickness. You can be delivered into the kingdom someday when the king comes back and takes the throne. Uh, or you can be delivered from the penalty of sin. And that's what we've been talking about, is this notion of uh, being uh, once for all forgiven by faith alone and Christ alone from the penalty of sin, which is eternal destined, which is e e eternity in a literal place of torment uh, called hell. I was talking to someone earlier today about how uh, these days it's hard to find someone that will actually talk about hell the way the Bible talks about it. You know, a fire that quencheth not, a lake of an everlasting lake of fire, as Jesus called it. Uh, and they, if they even mention hell at all, it's usually just you know in passing. But I, I believe in you know saying it the way the Bible says it, which is hell, it, which is the penalty for sin for those who refuse to receive the gospel, is a literal place of torment for all of eternity. And that's why this is such an important topic. So. Uh, we, we're going to be looking at some key terms uh, over the next few weeks uh, that relate to the doctrine of salvation. I call these wells of salvation. And we introduced last week this notion of the substitutionary atonement of Christ, which we defined as simply Jesus paid our sin penalty at the cross. That when he uh, died on the cross and shed his blood, he satisfied the wrath of God, paid the penalty, and made salvation available to any who would receive it by faith. And so we kind of went through the reason we need that. We talked about how uh, you know, it all started in the garden when uh, God warned Adam and Eve, if you eat from that tree, you'll surely die. And then, of course, they did. And so consequently, later Paul would tell us that because of that, one man, sin entered the world and death spread to all men. Uh, and so death is, or sin is in the blood and the penalty for that sin is... Uh, death. Um, and so we talked about the meaning of death and we, uh, we said that essentially death means separation. And so we, we were left off in the middle of this chart last time and so we'll just kind of pick it up uh, here. But if you just, anytime you see the word death, think separation. And then uh, kind of like whenever you see the word save, you think rescue or deliver. So you have to say, well, rescue or deliver from what? Well, when you see death, separation from what? And so we talked about how spiritual death uh, occurs at conception. It's because of original sin, and it means separation from God spiritually, that we are born dead in our trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1, and that we need to be born again by faith alone in Christ alone. And so that's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. Remember when he said, you've got to be born from above. We translate that again in our English Bibles, but it's actually the word above. He said, you need to be born from above. And Nicodemus was confused because the only birth he'd ever heard of was the, the earthly birth of your mother's womb. And he said, how can I go back into my mother's womb a second time? And the Jesus said, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm talking about a spiritual birth, a heavenly birth. You're physically alive, but you're spiritually dead. And, uh, and so he's talked about how if you're born once, you're going to die twice. Because if you know, you're know you born already dead spiritually, and if you don't remedy that, then you're going to die eternally and, and you know forever because of uh, the penalty of sin. But if you're born twice, you only die once. So if you, if you experience the second birth by faith alone and Christ alone, then you may die physically. But for the believer, physical death is just the golden key that unlocks the riches of eternity. And uh, uh, the Psalm tells, Psalms tells us that death in the sight of the Lord is precious for his saints. And so uh, if you're born twice, you die once, but if you're uh, born only once, you're going to die twice. And so then we went on and looked at uh, uh, physical death, which of course we all kind of understand, uh, but it's also due to the curse of sin. Had Adam and Eve not sinned, they would still be alive today. Uh, 
And this involves the separation of our soul and spirit, the immaterial part of man, the real us, the real you, from our body. So again, you're dealing with a separation. So at death, your, your physical body goes to the grave or is cremated or you know, lost at sea or buried under an avalanche or wherever it might be. That's your physical body of flesh and blood. But the real you, the immaterial part of you, goes to either immediately to be in the presence of the Lord or immediately into torment in hell if you've never been born again. And, uh, and so that's uh, the remedy for that, we said, is to be born again uh, by faith alone in Christ alone. So that death no longer is an enemy, but it's just a rite of passage. It's just a doorway, essentially, from this life into eternity when you die physically. And so uh, then we left off with uh, looking at eternal death. We had some good discussion about this, and I really appreciated the clarity and the nuance that we were able to get out of this. But you're born dead in your trespasses and sin, and if that remedy, if that situation is not remedied, that reality becomes eternal. Is where we kind of landed, as, as Gary had some good comments and talk, talking about that. If you die in unbelief, in other words then you've reached the point of no return. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. So if you die in unbelief, Jesus said, you know, you'll die in your sins. Uh, and what he meant by that is, you're going to die and face the penalty of sin. And so this becomes separation from God eternally. So you're born separated, but you can be reunited spiritually and born again and become part of the family of God if you have faith alone in Christ alone. But if you don't and you die, then that, e that spiritual death uh, becomes eternal. And so uh, that's kind of where we uh, left off. Any thoughts or comments as you've had some time now to think about it? You, 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 these are the three kind of key ones that we want to focus in on as we talk about the substitutionary atonement because that's the answer to it all. Because Jesus paid the penalty for sin, we don't have to worry about spiritual death if we've trusted Christ. Our physical death is no longer an enemy to be feared, and we don't have to worry about eternal death, all because Christ paid our penalty if we receive it uh, from you know, His forgiveness. So any questions or thoughts about any of this? All right, well, let's look at the two remaining types of death. And I did mention last time that if, in terms of the way the term death is used in Scripture... You could come up with seven different ways that it's used, but really only five of them relate to human beings in the sense of kind of, uh, you know, uh, the death of the person. Uh, so that's kind of why I call this five kinds of death in Scripture. The next one is interesting. Uh, in uh, the Bible, the, the word carnality is spoken of in terms of a death, and it comes from sin in the life of the believer. And this involves separation from fellowship with God. So you remember several weeks ago, we spent three weeks talking about family of God versus fellowship of God with God. And we talked about how once you're born again, you're part of the family of God. Nothing can separate you from that. We're kept by the power of God, 1 Peter 1, 3. But yet our sin breaks fellowship. And we can, we're supposed to walk in the light as He is in the light so that we can have fellowship with Him. Well, that notion of being out of fellowship with the Lord is called carnal death and it's restored or the remedy from it as we talked at length about several weeks ago uh, and those videos are on the uh, in the playlist for this midweek Bible study for those who didn't get to see it um, is confession of sin so we first see the term used in this way in Romans chapter 8 to be carnally minded is death now what's he talking about he's talking to believers chapters 6 through 8 are two believers about you know fellowship and sanctification and walking by faith and not by sight and walking in the new man and not the old man, that kind of thing. So clearly he's not talking here about eternal death. Um, he's talking about fellowship. In Revelation chapter 3, we see it used in the same way of a group of believers, the church in Sardis. He said, These things says, the Spirit, says he who is the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you're dead. Okay? You know, you're, you're not walking with the Lord. Right? And in 1 John 3, which we spent also three, different, three separate weeks talking about 1 John 3, um, 
And by the way, somebody uh, emailed me the other day that lives in California was watching that series, and they had a really nice email saying, I just want you to know this really helped me understand what was John was saying in 1 John 3. It's always been so confusing because it talked about practicing sin, and seeing that the word practice isn't in the text and understanding what that really meant was very helpful to me. So, you know, the Lord is using Plum Creek Chapel, and He's using the teaching that, you know, that, that emanates from here to really affect people. Yeah. I was going to say in in I think it's Matthew verses I mean chapter six verses something or other it says who whoever says and whoever hates his brother is in danger of hellfire. Yeah. How is that the carnal death or is that no in that in the Sermon on the Mount? Remember Jesus is making a you know, using a rhetorical device to get the attention of the self-righteous, legalistic Pharisees and scribes who thought that they had it all together. They had dotted all their I's and crossed all their T's. And so he says things like, if your eye offends you, gouge it out. And, you know, you know, the be- he starts out with the Beatitudes by explaining that these are the people that are really going to get into the kingdom and not you. And it, it kind of shock value they're like what are you talking about you know and then he goes on to say if you think that you're good because you've never murdered let me ask you have you lusted i mean have you hated and you know that's the context there of hating your brother so he's just not giving the means by which a person goes to heaven or goes to hell he's trying to describe that it's not what you do that matters it's what's in your heart have you recognized your unjustified state and by faith received the righteousness that i'm offering uh, in fact, right after the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, uh, which is chapters 5 through 7, the first thing that Matthew records is Jesus' interaction with a dirty, rotten, filthy Gentile, a centurion, whose servant dies, and, or is sick, I can't remember, and Jesus heals him. And Jesus commends the faith of that centurion. He says, I've not seen faith like that anywhere in Israel, which again was for the Sadducees and Pharisees sitting back in the background as Jesus talked with a kind of a harumph look on their face, thinking, who is this guy? And why is he cavorting with sinners? And why is he talking about, you know, righteousness that comes by faith and blah, blah, blah. And so he wanted them to know. And then he goes on to say, I've not seen such great faith in all of Israel. And And then he says, in fact, people will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. But the sons of the kingdom, referring to unbelieving Israel, will be cast out. So uh, so that's kind of the context. There. That's probably more than you wanted to know. But I don't think that has anything to do with the believer in the church age and whether they're walking in fellowship or not. So Paul, or John says, We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Same language, but completely different context and completely different point. That you can't be claiming to be in fellowship with Christ, and Jesus is God, God is love, John would later say in John 1 John 4, and yet hate somebody. That's not Christ-like, right? So as we talked about in that uh, 1 John discussion for two or three weeks there, uh, the born of God part of us, the new nature, never sins. So when you're sinning, you can't say, Jesus made me do that, you know. Well, that's the new nature. That's the born of God part of me. That's the new nature. It's the, it emanates from the old man. And so here, that's called death, carnal death. It means to be out of fellowship uh, with the Lord. Yeah. When he talks about love your brother, is he talking about the brethren of the church or just mankind in general? Uh, let's look at the context. I, I, my initial reaction was he's talking about your 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 physical brother, although I know often that term is used, brethren, to refer to believers, like James uses it that way a lot. But let's look at 1 John 3 and see if we can tell anything from the context. So, well, he does talk about Cain and Abel, so maybe he is talking about, I think, physical brother, like I said. Um, Why did he murder? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel. My brethren, that's talking about Adelphoi there, talking about believers. Um, We know that we pass from, because we love the brethren. So uh, actually it could be, I I think contextually it could be either way. 
Uh, and it really doesn't matter theologically because whether or not a person's a Christian doesn't dictate, obviously, whether we should love them. It's in your own heart. Right, yeah. You should love, you know, you should love everybody, you know. So, um, a good question. All right, so then finally there's positional death. And this is interesting, kind of the opposite of spiritual death. Sometimes the word death means separation from your unregenerate self. In other words, you've been placed in Christ. Um, we'll look at a couple of passages here in Galatians and Romans. But, you know, the Bible uses death both as the problem and as the remedy. You need to die to yourself to avoid spiritual death. Does that make sense? Let's look at these verses and maybe it'll become clear. Galatians 2.20. I think I referenced this verse on Sunday. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But Christ, who, Nevertheless, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, the old man has been put to death. And... The new man has been quickened, and we're now we're now a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. So it's just kind of an interesting play on words that you can be dead spiritually, but when you trust Christ and Him alone for salvation, then that old man is put to death, and the new man is made alive. Uh, in Romans six, this whole section here really uses death in that way. He says, "As many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus," it's talking about spiritual new life, being baptized into Christ by faith, uh, were baptized into his death. You were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So see again that reference to, you know, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. So positional death literally means we've been, we've died to our old position and been given a new position. We were a son of the devil. Now we become a son of God, a child of God, right? Uh, he goes on, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death. So here again, it's weird because he's using death in a positive sense. We've now been born again, right? Um, you know, whereas spiritual death, Ephesians 2.1, Colossians 1, you're born dead in our trespasses and sin is uh, just the opposite. We've been uh, united together in the likeness of death. Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, same language here as in Galatians 2.20, has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. There it is, positional death. You're no longer a slave to sin, you're in Christ. That's the reason uh, why... In, where is it, Romans 7, at the end of the chapter, Paul describes the, the ongoing struggle with sin that the believer has. Remember he says the thing throughout chapter 7 that, you know, sin wills to have me and the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. The things I know I should do, I don't do. And then he climaxes it with, O wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Right? So, you know, the old man is dead. Why would you want to live like a dead man? You know, and that word picture, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, it, that he's using there is a reference to a Roman method of uh, execution where they would, uh, a condemned criminal, would they would strap a cadaver to his body, a physical dead body, and he would walk around until the diseases and the corrosion, all that caught onto him and he ended up dying. So that's the word picture Paul's playing there. Is who will rescue me from this body of death? So basically what he's saying is, you've been set free. You're now alive. The newness of life. Why in the world would you want to live like a dead guy? All right? Yeah. Well, we, we still have the old man. We do, yeah. He's just not active. Anymore. Unless you activate him. That's right. <laughs> and that's Paul's point. Even if he's dead now, you yeah, by walking in the flesh, by, you know, all the different metaphors that Paul uses, slave and free, dead and alive, fle uh, walking by faith versus walking by sight. And so that's why what we've been talking about in Hebrews is so powerful to me. At least this is the way the Lord's really 
encouraged me through this study that we're doing on Sunday mornings is that we need to set our minds on things above and not think in earthly terms. Because the <laughs> earthly vision says that apple is really shiny. But we need to step back and say, no, I'm a new man. I'm a child of the king. Ch children of the king don't live like that. I'm not going to dress like a pauper. I'm not going to live like a slave man. I'm not going to walk back into the prison that I've been set free from. And I'm not going to live like a dead man, right? In fact, he goes on in this chapter here at the in verse 11. He says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. <coughs> this is a command. In fact, amazingly, in the book of Romans, which is filled with doctrinal, powerful information and challenges to the believer theologically and doctrinally, and at the end of the book in chapters 12 uh, to 16, uh, you know, uh, practically, this is the, you have to get all the way to chapter 6, verse 11, before you get to the first command ever in the book of Romans. This is the imperative in Greek right here. Reckon yourselves dead to sin. So you're right, you can be, you, you know, you are dead, but he, the, the old man is still active, but only if you reckon him to be. Only if you consider yourself, only if you live in that realm. So you're not supposed to do that. That would apply also to, like, if you're feeling inferior. Because I've been in situations where I've felt inferior to those around me, but I tell myself that I'm a child of the king. Amen, yeah. I have no reason to yeah. feel yeah, God doesn't want you to think poorly of yourself. You, you have value in the Lord's eyes. And we should never allow other people, their words, their status, their whatever it may be, to make us feel insignificant. You know? but, but, I mean, this is key. Um, you know, people misunderstand the method of sanctification. And you know what I mean by sanctification, right? Justification is by faith alone and Christ alone when you're born again, saved, eternally saved, what have, all the different synonyms for that. Sanctification is the gradual life period over the life of a believer where you're becoming more and more like Christ, you're, you're becoming mature in the faith, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're conforming, gradually being set apart from that old man, right? That's sanctification or sometimes called discipleship. How, how can you grow in your knowledge of the Lord so that you, you know, again, goes back to my paradigm that I've talked a lot about, know, trust, believe. When you know the Lord, you'll trust Him. When you trust Him, I mean, know, trust, obey, you'll obey Him, right? So a lot of people, when it comes to sanctification, and, and this is what Galatians is about, they think that you're saved by faith, but then you're sanctified by works, so most sanctification books or books on how to be a good Christian, how to live the Christian life, how to be a better Christian, how to live godly, however you want to say it, books on that subject more often than not are basically just a checklist approach. They tell you you got to read your Bible more, you got to pray more, you got to share Christ more, you got to come to church more, you sometimes even got to give more, and they just do this seven times a day and for this ten minutes a day and stop doing this and start doing that. It's all about behavior. That's not how you get sanctified. You get sanctified by faith. The method of sanctification is the same as the method of justification. Faith. And the more you trust God, the more you'll obey. Because whatever's not of faith is sin. So the best uh, treatment I've ever seen, and I recommend it all the time, on the sanctification process is the chapter uh, in my book, Freely by His Grace, which is a compendium of articles with uh, 10 or 12 different contributors. And the guy that wrote the chapter on sanctification in there, I think he nails it. Um, and, uh, and, and it's called Freely by His Grace, and uh, the chapter is by Kurt Witzig. But he really shows through a treatment of Romans, and especially Romans 6 here, that it's all about recognizing your identity in Christ. It's not about trying harder or pulling yourself up by your bootstraps or self-will power. It's about <clears throat> recognizing that I have died to the old man, I am now alive in Christ. Now, the problem that we get into, and we'll get into this down the road, is that some people teach that the sanctification process is guaranteed and that every believer will necessarily 
grow and produce good works and, and become more Christ-like over time. And if they're not, then they make the hasty conclusion, well, they must not ever have been saved. It's the Calvinistic doctrine of perseverance of the saints. The Bible doesn't teach that. There's a world of difference between should and will. Every believer should walk by faith and not by sight. They should put on the new man and not the old man. They should uh, walk, you know, in, in the spirit and not after the flesh. They should live like a free man and not a slave. They should live like they're alive in Christ and not the dead man. But it's precisely because we still have that old nature that all of these passages, including this command that you see on the screen right now, are in Scripture. If it was guaranteed or automatic, we wouldn't, he wouldn't have to command us to do it. But it's not automatic because we can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit. We can uh, not walk in the Spirit, right? Uh, we, have to, we have to yield to Him. He doesn't force us to obey any more than He forced us to believe. <laughs> of course, Calvinists think He forces you to believe too, so it's all a lockstep <laughs> system. You're completely passive. You absolutely have nothing to do to say in the matter. If you're elect, you're forced to believe the gospel. You couldn't not believe it. You couldn't reject it if you wanted to. If you're not elect... Well, good luck. You know, you're you're uh, you know, you may want to believe the gospel, but you can't, right? Cuz for them faith is not the instrumental uh, cause of eternal life and the new birth. It is the involuntary response to the new birth, which is not the case. But we'll talk about that more as we go through. So, isn't it interesting uh, how, you know, we see this term death used in these different uh, ways uh, here as it relates to the doctrine of eternal salvation. You're born spiritually dead, separated from God. You can also become physically dead where your immaterial part, your body and soul are separated, your spirit and soul are separated from your body. If you die in unbelief, you will be eternally separated from God. But if you by faith trust Christ, then you become positionally dead in the sense that you're separated from your old unregenerate self. And as a new nature, as a new believer in Christ, you can become carnally dead if you walk in the darkness and not after the light, if you're out of fellowship with the Lord. So just several different ways that the separation of death is used in relation to uh, our eternal life. Yeah. So as a believer, you experience four of those five. Only when you don't experience is the eternal death. Correct. Well, and you mean have experienced at some point. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's and... that's a good way to put it. Yeah, as a believer, you experience everything but eternal death because you've been saved by grace through faith and you will not face eternity separated from God. You'll face eternity with God, right? Uh, everyone was born dead, and then by faith they become alive. Um, now, not every believer will die physically, right, technically, if the rapture happens. So if the rapture happens in your lifetime, then you would not experience physical death either. But, yeah, you're right. It's a good kind of, it shows me that, you know, I'm making sense, which is not always the case, yeah. So you could be positionally dead up to the point, if you're saved already, positionally dead up to the point where you actually physically die, and then it's taken care of. You are positionally dead? Only while you're alive. Is that true? That's the way I'm looking at it, because once you do die, if you are saved, positionally you will be with Christ. So you won't be the old person at all anymore because that person is totally gone. Well, once you have trusted Christ and Him alone, your position can never change. So your position is in Christ for all of eternity. In Christ as a part of the church is not just an earthly term. It's, be, it's our identity. It's who we are for all of eternity. And we have special blessings that come with being in Christ such as ruling and reigning with him and being priests and kings in the kingdom someday. Okay, so positionally is the death is the death of the old man. Right, right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, the old man has died, remember? Uh, so he says, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I that lives. And that will never change, right? 
or he said, uh, we've been baptized into his death, uh, or he said, you know, we've been united together in the likeness of his death, and um, so we should reckon ourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Now, we won't have, once we go to heaven, we will no longer have that struggle between the old man and the new man, and maybe that's more to your point. Yeah. We won't have to follow this command because, uh, you know, we, we no longer have that struggle. But our position in Christ, having died to the old man, never changes. What changes is our willingness to live like that. And then, yes, after we die, we don't have to worry about it anymore. We, we are glorified. We no longer have the flesh, for sure. Good, good point. Yeah. It's almost like one of the worst sins is the sin of forgetfulness. Forgetting who we are, forgetting our position. Yeah. And as you were speaking about death and life, it made me think, and you mentioned it at the end, uh, about light and dark, and day and night. And as soon as you turn from darkness, you're, you know, you're facing the sun and it's day. And as soon as you turn from light, then you're facing darkness. And so that separation. Yeah. If you're separate from the sun, then you're you're facing your darkness, and if you're turning away from the yep. darkness, you're you're in the you're darkness. separate from the yeah. light. Yeah, there's something between you. Yeah, and yeah. the fact that we rotate around the sun is kind of a neat physical picture of of what it is to be separated from the light. Yeah. And now, as your shadow is that. Say what now? When you turn away from the light, you see your shadow. Right. Work that into it. Well, yeah. and well, that's we Sunday's message, beyond the shadow, living beyond the shadows. That's what we're talking about, Hebrews 9. So There'll be no shadows in heaven, right? That's right, yeah. There's that's no sun either because the, the the eternal throne is the light, right? And there's no darkness. Crazy. All, right. All right, so with that background, yeah. Before we leave, yeah, can sure. I just bring up a pet peeve? Yeah. You, you had um, the verse up before about, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. I, yeah, actually, I said it. I don't think I had it up, but yeah. Okay, just Christians that have spent tens and hundreds of millions of dollars on books and movies yeah. for people who have died and gone to heaven and come back. Right. I mean, oh. Yeah. So let's talk about that. No, I agree. That's, it's more than a pet peeve. Uh, theologically, it's just simply not right. However, um, there is a, in this present age, and I think this is, is biblical, it's a sign of the times, there is a deep interest in otherworldliness. You know, people are just, unlike, you know, in the modern era where everything was either science or faith, no middle ground. Now, a lot of people who are unsaved recognize there's something more to life. There, There's something out there. And so I think it's a sign of the times that so many, especially Christians, are interested in all of this, these writings that claim to be telling us what's on the other side and then came back. Now, you know, I've actually thought about this a lot and talked with people about it a lot. Um, I, I've learned through the, through the years not to question people's experiences, but to question, based on the Word of God, people's interpretation of their experience, right? So... I don't doubt for a second that in some of these, some of it's charlatans just looking to make a quick buck. No question. I think we can all agree on that. But I think in some cases, something really happened to these people. Uh, you know, the subconscious mind is a powerful thing. And, you know, the Luciferians have known that for a long time. They can do all kinds of wild stuff with mind control and, you know, whatever. So whatever the experience the person had, they probably think they went to heaven. That doesn't mean it's true because we know that reality can't contradict Scripture. So uh, it's kind of like speaking in tongues, you know. A lot of people have these experiences today, and I, I'm not saying it's all fake. But I can tell you that what they think is speaking in tongues does not comport with the biblical teaching on speaking in tongues, which is the ability to speak in a known but unlearned language, not random syllabification or gibberish, right? But I don't want to sit here and just, like some people do, you know, say, oh, those are a bunch of fakes and they're just making it up. And I mean, most of them, yeah, but not all. I mean, people have weird experiences. So someone might have a weird dream and wake up and truly believe they've been to heaven. The same way people will say, wow, God told me, right? Well, how does that comport with Scripture? 
And again, we have to nuance it a little bit and say, well, maybe the Spirit of God put something on your heart or was leading you in a certain way or convicting you or encouraging you, but was that the God Almighty creator of the universe speaking new revelation where we need to get out our pens and add a 67th book? No. But yeah, it bothers me too when people, when it's so plain, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. So if you, if you haven't faced the judgment, you haven't died. Now, medically... I mean, what, how do you define death, right? Is it when the heart stops beating? A lot of people have died then, more than once, right? Is it when the brain cells stop registering? I mean, I'm not a medical doctor, so you could make some arguments medically, but we know spiritually that, 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 that ultimate physical death, when the immaterial part of man separates from the material part of man, physical death, only happens once, according to Scripture. Did you have a comment? Yeah, a question. Just a question on uh, which category you would put Romans uh, six twenty three. It's the famous for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. I think it's life. it's both. It, it's not sanctification. I think he's speaking even though the whole section is about sanctification. He's speaking there of our eternal salvation, and okay, so so you would put it in the not the carnal but the eternal one and physical because the wages of sin, the consequence of sin, was both. Spiritual death and physical death, uh -huh. both. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's always been a peculiar one because it's used most often in an evangelistic, eternal sense, but right. it happens to be in the context of sin in the life of a believer. Yeah, but and and some people I think overplay that. I mean, we get a lot of truths that are universal statements in in the midst of another context, right? Sure. You know, uh, you know, a lot of the attributes of God in the Old Testament. Uh, are in the midst of historical narratives that really have nothing to do with the context, but because, like God said in, uh, where was it, Habakkuk, I think, I, the Lord, do not change. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, we can take that to the bank, right? So in, in the context here, he's saying, you have been set free from sin. So he's clearly talking about believers mm -hmm. here. Having become slaves of God, you have fruit of us, and to that end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but he's, so he's sort of saying, so remember, you were dead spiritually, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, to me, the, the, the contrasting parallelism with the word but settles the issue. What's the opposite of eternal life in Christ? Spiritual death, mm -hmm. right? So I don't, I, don't, I don't, I mean, I understand the context, believe me. I, I, I love Romans 6 through 8. I just think in the midst of that context, he's hearkening back to a spiritual reality. But, you know, a lot of people make a big deal about that, and I just disagree with them. But it t tends to be the same people who think, for example, that, you know, believers can be under the wrath of God, and that, you know, Romans 1.16 is talking about sanctification. You know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation. You know, they, they just have a whole different take on the whole book of Romans, which I just respectfully disagree with. Yeah. I would say, what do you think happened with Lazarus? So, when he died, and then he resurrected. Yeah. So, so first of all, resurrected? that happened before Hebrews 9.27 was said, was, was revealed by God from heaven, right? That was revealed in 67 AD. Lazarus was raised from the dead in 33. Secondly, it's not just Lazarus. We have a lot of token resurrections that happened at the resurrection of our Lord. Remember that? Graves were popping open all over the place, right? So I think those were unique uh, things sanctioned by God, sort of miracles that don't fit the paradigm. But now, in the present age, according to Hebrews 9.27, it is clear that it's appointed unto men once to die. So, make sense? Yeah. One quick observation. The verse you have on the screen, reckon yourselves to be dead. It reminds me of a message I heard one time by uh, Boyd Nicholson, and he was a pilot in World War II, and I remember he talked in that message about a military term called a dead reckoning. So when you're flying through the clouds and you have no idea where you're at, there's a way back decades ago where you could triangulate and you take what's called a dead reckoning and you could figure out exactly where you were on it using a map or something, and he tied it to this I think it was this verse. Or oh, I'm sure it was, yeah. Other reckon verses, but he, he tied it to talking about positionally in Christ. You're standing in Christ. He's like, you know, when you're up in the clouds and you don't know where you're at, 
it's like a dead reckoning military term that once you're saved, whether you feel like it in the moment or not, you're maybe going through a rough patch, you are there whether you feel like it or not. Yeah, I love that. A lot of the idioms that we use in English come from the King James Bible, you know. Yeah. And uh, I use the phrase dead reckoning quite often, and, and, the, and what it generally means is you're sort of your visceral sense, you're just sort of, you're not you know, necessarily getting out all the instruments and trying to figure it out, you're just saying, what's my dead reckoning here, you know, what's my sense? And, and so uh, that's, in, that's a great analogy, I think, to uh, when, when all of, everything around you seems to be falling apart, remember who you are in Christ. Right, you know? right. Remember your position. And the other observation, real quick, my fruit drink here says, "Shake well, separation is natural." <laughs> it, made, it made me think that you know, of the carnal road yeah. up there. If as believers were kind of stagnant, that's not very attractive to non-believers, you know. But Jesus was anything but stagnant. He was engaging, he yeah. was asking questions, and people were attracted. He liked to shake things up. I, I love that. <laughs> For in, case, in case it didn't come through well on the recording, he said he's holding a, a juice a, a bottle, and, he, and it says on there, shake well, separation is natural. And I think there's a spiritual truth in that. Remember back in, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul talked about the spiritual, the natural, the spiritual, and the carnal. The natural man is the spiritually dead man who's never been saved. The spiritual man is the man who by faith has been born again. He's no longer spiritually dead. He's alive in Christ. But the carnal is the one who's living like the natural man. So yeah, it does come in our own flesh. You know, separation from the fellowship with the Lord comes naturally. That's a that's a great illustration. You should copyright that or YouTube, YouTube it or tweet it or twit it or something. I don't know what they do these days. Yeah, yeah, there you go. All right, so what I want to do in the remainder of our time, which we don't have a lot of time left, but we'll just pick up next time and continue talking about this, having sort of identified the nature of death as separation and some of the key biblical concepts related to that, I want to then go back to this idea of substitutionary atonement and, and make sure we understand what we mean when we talk about Christ died in our place. Uh, so let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that having died to sins, we might live by righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Now what is he quote, where is he quoting that last part, by whose stripes we are healed from? Isaiah, Isaiah 53, right? Now, there are still people today that I come across, whole, whole groups of people, that think Isaiah 53 is about physical healing. <laughs> that everybody who's physically sick is supposed to be healed. And if you're physically sick, it's because you haven't you know, had enough faith and claimed, that, claimed Jesus healing for you. No, Isaiah 53 is not talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual uh, death. Let's take a look at it. Uh, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I heard a preacher one, one time talking about this passage, and he, he said, to sum, sum it all up, it comes down to three words. Him for me. Him for me, over and over again. Him, capital H, for me. Him for me. Jesus for me, right? He bore my griefs and carried my sorrows, yet we esteemed, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. I'm making it singular here, but you get the point. The chastisement for my peace was upon him, him for me. That's what the substitutionary atonement's all about. He died in my place. It should have been me on the cross, and it was him. It should have been you on the cross, and it was him. He took our place. By his stripes, we are healed, right? Him for me. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of me, him for me. Remember that? So that's really the essence of substitutionary atonement. Him for me. He paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we could never pay. Right? Um, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, we're positionally placed in Christ at the moment of faith. Or Galatians 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us, him for me, right? Him for me. Or Mark 10.45, we'll 
spend the rest of our time talking about these two verses here, which are so powerful in the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, th this is a key passage supporting the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. Let's break it down a little bit. That word for is the Greek word anti, which means in place of. In place of. It's a preposition. Gave his life a ransom in place of many. He suffered death in the place of sinners. He didn't die as an example. right? He died literally, vicariously in our place. And then the word ransom here is the word lutron, which means price of release. So he gave his life paying the price of release in the place of many. Okay. Now, if you look at the parallel passage in 1 Timothy 2, you see something very powerful that might not, you might not notice in the English, but when you kind of dig a little deeper, you see how beautifully this supports the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, and in particular of the unlimited atonement of Christ. Paul puts it this way, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Now, you notice anything different there? What did we see in Mark 10? Many. Gave his life a ransom for many. Paul says he gave his life a ransom for all. Another thing you, you might notice, the word for is different. You might not notice anything. It's not auntie, it's huper. Huper, which doesn't mean in the place of, but on behalf of. Big difference, right? Not only that, but the word ransom is slightly different as well. It's still lutron, but it adds the prefix auntie. In other words, it's, it's a price of release as a substitute. It's, it's your stand-in. All right? So now, what are we saying? Paul is saying that Christ gave himself as a substitute price of release for all. Everyone on earth. But that is actually only applied as a place of release in the place of those who by faith trusted Christ. That is, many, not all. See the difference? So he, he, he paid our ransom, our price of release, and, and, and not only ours, but all. It's the same thing we see in 1 John 2, 2, which we're going to come to later. He, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not just for ours, but for the sins of the whole world, right? So Paul is saying that he is the substitute price of release, because remember, he doesn't use the word ante here, meaning in the place of. Uh, he adds that to the, to, to the word uh, lutron, uh, ransom. So he's the, you might call it the substitute ransom on behalf of everyone. The price has been paid. Anyone on earth can be saved, right? It's a universal offer. Jesus said, come one, come all. Whosoever will, let him drink freely of the water of life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me, right? So it's a price of release that's been paid for everyone. However, Jesus himself, knowing that not everyone will believe the gospel, and in fact, he says in John, you know, those who don't believe in me will die in their sins. When he uses the same term, ransom, he just speaks of it actually being in the place of, a different preposition, it's actually in the place of the many. That is, only those who trust Christ and Him alone. So I've just always thought this is a, the, one of the most powerful illustrations of the unlimited atonement uh, of Christ. And that's important. We're going to spend all of next session uh, talking about it, but Lewis Berry Chafer put it this way, Jesus' death made all people savable. Okay. Nobody who dies can claim that God sent them to hell. First of all, God tried to protect us from the penalty of sin, which is spiritual death, when he warned from the very beginning, don't eat the forbidden fruit. So he, first of all, he loved us so much he gave us a very strong warning. 
But he also gave us free will. And what did we do? We rebelled and went right over and took a great big bite. So God would be perfectly just in us facing the consequences that he warned us about. Right? But he took the next step in his incredible love and grace and mercy and said, I'm going to provide an out. I'm going to solve this predicament that you got yourselves into. And that was he sent his eternal son to come to the earth, born of a virgin, live a perfect, holy, sinless life, die in our place and the place of the whole world on the cross so that anyone who in simple childlike faith comes to him and receives the free gift of forgiveness no longer has to face that eternal penalty. Right? So his death, the atoning work of Christ, makes all people savable. But it does not, in and of itself, save anybody. And that's exactly what Calvinists believe. Calvinists believe that the atonement itself actually saves you. Which is why faith in their scheme is not all that critical, right? I've talked to hyper-Calvinists literally, uh, physically many times, one-on-one -on -one at, at my resource booth or after speaking at a conference, and they, they say, you know, if a child uh, dies before they're old enough to express faith, it doesn't really matter. Faith is just the involuntary response. Anyway, what really matters is their election. If they're elect, they go to heaven. If they're not elect, they go to hell. Same thing with aborted babies, right? Because God saved only the elect, and he saved them how? By the atoning work of Christ, right? So let me give you uh, would, some examples. Why would any Calvinist have children? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just like, whoop, it's yeah. just kind of... Yeah. Well, you know, it's like, what does the Calvinist say when he falls down the stairs? Boy, I'm glad that's over. I mean, what else can he say, right? You know? Uh, James Montgomery Boyce, a leading Calvinist, said it this way. Limited atonement is the doctrine that Christ's death was a real atonement for the specific sins of his people, as a result of which they are truly saved. Okay, the atonement saves you. Or... Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only and actually secured salvation for them. Or Louis Burkhoff. The Bible clearly teaches, no it doesn't, but that's what he says, that the effect of the work of Christ is not merely to make atonement possible, which is what we just said, but to reconcile men to God and to put them in actual possession of eternal salvation. So when Christ died on the cross and rose again 2,000 years ago, he actually secured salvation for those who were already elect from the foundation of the world. That's why man is passive, according to Calvinists, in the salvation equation. Faith is not the instrumental cause of our eternal salvation. It's just an involuntary thing that comes next, whether you want to or not. If you're elect, you'll do it. If you're not, you won't. But you don't do anything. You're just you know, walking along as an unregenerate person all of a sudden you get zapped now you th say i think i'll believe the gospel i don't know why but i'm going to believe the gospel but that has no bearing on whether you were saved or not because you were saved because of the atoning work of christ or by the atoning work of christ charles hodge uh, 19th century early 20th century uh a millennialist he said the righteousness of christ did not make the salvation of men merely possible it secured the actual salvation of those for whom he wrought. Or R.C. Sproul, who I can only assume no longer believes this because he went home to be with the Lord not long ago. But when he was still with us, he said, limited atonement declares that the mission and death of Christ was restricted to a limited number of people, his sheep. Or Wayne Grudem. For God could not condemn to eternal punishment anyone whose sins have been paid for. That would be demanding a double payment. It's the reason they, you know, because their view is the atonement is actually what saves you, then, you know, he, they can't believe in unlimited atonement because they acknowledge some people go to hell. And how could saved people go to hell, right? So what we believe, and here's John MacArthur, for whom did Christ die? He died for all who would believe because they were chosen, called, justified, and granted repentance and faith by the Father. God does it all, right? The atonement is limited to those who believe who are the elect of God. And one more, J.I. Packer, Limited Atonement states that the death of Christ actually put away the sins of all God's elect and ensured that they would be brought to faith 
through regeneration. Christ did not die in the efficacious sense for everyone. So we would say that the Bible does not teach that. And I'm going to give you uh, an example here in a second. If you'll give me, we could stop now or we could go five or ten more minutes. What do you want to do? So you keep going. Let's go just for five or ten more minutes, and then we can re rehash it a little bit more, <laughs> more next week. But uh, so again, I want to state the issue as clearly as possible. To some people, the Calvinists, Christ's atoning work on the cross actually saved people. Therefore, they hold to the view called limited atonement because they acknowledge that some people go to hell, and if the if Christ's death saved you then, of course, it has to be limited only to the saved, right? We believe, the Bible plainly teaches, but if you don't bring your presuppositions and theology to the text and let the text speak for itself, that Christ died for the sins of the whole world. And so here's where I quote one of my favorite mentors, Bob Leitner, Lightning Bob, we call him. He said, let us be biblicists above everything else and at all costs. And when and where our position conflicts with man-made systems of theology, let it be, <laughs> Right? So what did Jesus say? Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. It seems pretty clear that faith removes the penalty of sin. The atoning work of Christ did not remove it. Made it possible to be removed. I mean, there's no, this is an if-then statement. If you fail to believe, and in the context here it's the gospel, you will die in your sins. And you'll, you'll pay that penalty, right? Uh, or 1 John 2, 2, the verse I quoted a moment ago. He himself is the propitiation, meaning the satisfaction of God's wrath for our sins. And not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world, right? Now I want to I'll, We'll come back to this next week. I want to just finish out, uh, you know, the proof texts here for unlimited atonement. But I can give you several uh, examples of how Calvinists handle this first. I've got four quotes and they all take it a little different way because it's like when you reject the plain <coughs> face value meaning of it, you end up all over the map. But how do you interpret that, right? Uh, but let's go uh, to a couple of other verses here. Uh, Hebrews 2.9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for the elect. Is that what it says? No, for everyone. His death was for everyone. And again, we already looked at this verse, but there's one God, one mediator between God and men, seems to be speaking in broad absolute terms here. I, I, I don't see how you can get around it. Who gave himself as a ransom for all. For all. Or John 4.42. Uh, he said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Every time they see world, like in John 3.16, they assume it means world of the elect. I mean, look how many times Jesus says this in John 3.16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world. Now, where did God send his Son? To, I mean, in, in the context here of the world, he sent from heaven to earth, not just to the elect, right? So if you take it as Calvinists do that John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world of the elect, then he's turning around the next sentence and using world in a broader sense. There's no doubt about it. He's contrasting heaven with the world. He didn't send the son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. According to Scripture, Christ's death is sufficient for all, but efficient only for those who believe. He paid the sins for the whole world. Now, you may or may not cash that check if you've never trusted in Christ. You haven't, you haven't received the, the gift that he's providing for you. But gift by its very nature has to be received. A forced gift is no gift at all. And compelling people to believe the gospel, forcing them to believe the gospel, whether they want to or not, that's not a gift. That's not a gift at all, right? John 3, 18. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. Again, faith alone is the factor, is the key factor, the in instrumental cause of eternal life. Uh, but to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. 
he's declared righteous. Again, John 1, 12. As many as receive him, to those he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name. How do you receive the gift? A physical gift you receive by taking, grasping it with your hands and taking it out of the other person's hands and saying, okay, now it's mine. A spiritual gift like eternal life and forgiveness of sins you receive by believing in his name. 160 times the New Testament conditions eternal life upon faith alone. Again, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. I mean, again, it couldn't be uh, more clear. So the last thing I want to mention, which I think is a key passage here, and we'll come back and rehash this a little bit more next week, but is 2 Peter 2.1. What if we could show you that there's a passage in Scripture that plainly says Jesus purchased someone with his blood and that person ends up in hell? Seems like that would settle the issue once and for all, that the atoning work of Christ paid the penalty, purchased the whole, for the whole world. Right? Not just for the elect, because obviously the elect aren't going to hell. Well, listen to First Peter, or excuse me, Second Peter 2 1. Speaking of false prophets, he says there are false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who secretly bring in destructive heresies. And what do they do? They deny the Lord who bought them. Clearly, the Lord purchased them with his blood. Okay. Right? And yet, if you go on and read through the whole context, you find out that at the end, these are the people for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. To me, first, or excuse me, Second Peter 2 is slams the door shut. Because you can't have people who are purchased by the blood of Christ end up in hell unless the instrumental cause of avoiding spiritual death and eternal death is faith alone in Christ alone. Yeah, he bought them because he paid the price for the whole world. But they never received the gospel, therefore they're going to hell. Make sense? All right, so lots more to say about that. We can get into other issues but uh, next week we'll wrap up this notion of substitutionary atonement kind of close the loop a little bit deal with a little bit more about limited versus unlimited and then we'll move on to another deep well of salvation any closing thoughts or questions all right awesome thank you so much